It's yours. Thank you, Tone. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Martin Lambrecht. Um, I'm a big fan and a big user of open data. Um, I'm a freelance data journalist and visualization consultant, and I think I can uh, safely say that I own a big part of my career to uh, open data and, and the use thereof. Um, but over the years, I have noticed some things that um, annoyed me a bit um, when looking for open data and using open data, and I think a lot of these things are also contributing to um, hindering open data to be used more than it is today. And so, uh, in the next couple of minutes, I will walk you through some of these annoyances, and I will try to um, come up with solutions to these annoyances so that um, open data publishing um, is um, more centered on, on users. Um, and so, um, the subtitle of my talk is Open Data for Humans, so not only for computers, but also uh, for humans. Um, Okay, um, I think um, I might discourage some of you in the room uh, as open data publishers, um, but yeah, don't, don't be discouraged. Um, I don't want to criticize your work as open data publishers because as I said, I'm a big fan, um, but I do want to raise some concerns. Um, and maybe uh, there are some things you can take away from my talk uh, and can implement in, in your uh, data publishing or in your data portal. So uh, please don't be offended or don't be discouraged. Um, I just want to um, make you think about the user a little bit more. I'm going to start off with um, a little story about um, what I did with open data. And this is a quote um, I think many of you can agree with. Um, but, and it's not really a very strong quote, except when it comes uh, from this guy. Uh, this is Jan Peumans, the uh, president of the Flemish parliament. And of course, when he says that there are some people in parliament literally doing nothing, um, well, me as a data journalist, I'm triggered. I want to find out who those lazy members of parliament are. And so I went looking for the data. And the uh, Flemish parliament as um, open data uh, API and policy. Um, okay. And so I, I went looking for the documentation of this API and, um, sorry. And it's all there, of course. All the data I was interested in is uh, in the API. Um, but then when I went looking through how I could retrieve um, information about the activities of all the members of parliament, I had to uh, look into a lot of these API calls and I had to store a lot of information and then uh, make other calls. So in the end, I ended up uh, not using the API of the Flemish parliament. So although I'm a nerd, um, I'm also a bit of a programmer, so um, I know my JSON from my XML, um, but I wasn't been able to extract that information from that API because it was, uh, for me, it was a bit too difficult. It, it was uh, a bit too technically challenging, and uh, as a journalist, you're under a lot of time pressure. So um, I ditched the idea of you using the um, uh, API because it was giving me uh, too, much head too much headaches. And um, I switched to another strategy, and what I did was um, going to the website of the Flemish Parliament, where you have a nice overview of all the uh, members of Parliament. And when you click through, you get an overview of how many documents each member of Parliament filed and um, how many times they had said something in Parliament. So instead of using the API, I just wrote a scraper uh, that went to this page, then clicked through to the individual um, um, uh, pages of each member of parliament and took the data from there. So in the end, I was happy. Uh, I had the data uh, I wanted and um, we also made uh, this piece. So we identified the lazy MPs. I'm oh, sorry, this is in Dutch. Uh, we, we made a, a nice graphic out of it. And um, over here are the members of parliament um, well, each dot is uh, one MP, as you can see. And on the top right are the uh, people, uh, what we called were the busy bees, people talking a lot, but also filing a lot of documents. Here are the chatterers who talk a lot, but don't file a lot of uh, documents. And Herman de Croo is obviously one of them. 
these are the silent forces who don't say much, but they are very active. They file a lot of documents. And then, of course, here are the lazy MPs. Um, we made a little button to zo zoom in on them. And the most lazy one was uh, Gwendolyn Ritter, who is now not in Parliament anymore. And surprisingly, Jan Peumans is there himself. But I think his, his activities as president don't count um, in this data set. Um, so this was a nice exercise. Um, but after I made it, I started thinking about, um, well, this, this wasn't really meant to be. Um, I had to scrape the website in order to get the data. Well, there's an open data policy by the, uh, by the parliament. And um, so this is one of the things I, I want to talk about. If, if I, as a technical journalist, can't access this information, then I think there's something wrong. Um, and that's um, really the, the baseline of um, what I want to show you next. <clears throat> so maybe we can go check um, or talk a bit about what open data really is. And for that, I want to go to the uh, Open Knowledge website. And uh, the print is a bit small for the people in the back, I think, but it's stated here that everyone must be able to use, reuse, and redistribute. There should be no discrimination against fields of endeavor or against uh, persons or groups. Um, so I think this is a really uh, valuable definition or a part of the definition. Um, but you, you can interpret this in, in multiple ways. And um, if you focus on the first part, uh, everyone must be able to use, reuse, and redistribute. You can interpret it the, as um, anyone should have access, but you can also say that uh, anyone with the knowledge they have already should be able to uh, get access to the data. And I think at the moment um, that's not really the case. Um, and I'll illustrate this uh, with a little analogy, and I will keep on using that analogy uh, throughout the rest of my talk. So I think you can compare um, open data uh, in an API as uh, a can of soup. Um, there's some juicy things in there, there's value in there, um, but in order to access it, you have to have some tools and knowledge uh, to get to the content. So uh, obviously, if you want to open a can, um, you need a can opener, and you need to know how to handle a can opener. And only then you can get access to the content. Um, like the API of the Flemish uh, Parliament, um, I didn't have enough knowledge to get to the, the juicy bits of the soup, so I had to use another strategy. My strategy was a bit like this. Um, this is actually a screenshot from uh, a video on YouTube um, that shows you 10 ways you can open a can without a can opener, and it's uh, very interesting. But I challenge you to open a can of soup uh, with an X like that. Um, it will be uh, really difficult and uh, a bit dirty, I guess. So my, my first point here is, um, well, is your data access accessible to non-programmers? Because if you interpret the um, definition of open data like I did, then a lot of uh, open data isn't really open um, because uh, you need some skills and tools in order to access uh, the data. And um, it's also important to have the data uh, human readable. Um, because you can say, yeah, everybody has access, but if it's only you and your peers that can read the data, then you will also not reach a lot of the people interested in the data. So instead of um, offering a can of soup or a can of food, offer um, data uh, in this way, uh, really open, anyone can access it. You can eat it with your bare hands. There is no knowledge needed um, to uh, to get the data or to access the data. Anyone really can, uh, can um, eat this uh, juicy bowl of pasta. So my first advice would be to provide non-technical and easy to di digest views uh, of your data instead of only um, offering data as an API, for example, that a lot of people will have a hard time accessing. <clears throat> Then if people have the data, they need to know, uh, of, or when they have found the data, people need to know um, how to really start making a delicious meal with the data they have. Um, so if you think about the data sets as ingredients, then you also have to have some kind of uh, stepwise uh, guidance 
for your users, for your users, so that he or she knows how to process the data, uh, what can be concluded from it, what not, and um, how they can bring this data to uh, to a product they they want to uh, build or uh, or use. So my second. Um, advice would be to provide documentation and examples and tutorials on, on how to use the data. Um, the description on the, the API page of the Flemish Parliament was really cryptic. There wasn't, wasn't a lot of explication and it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't enough for me. So um, I think if you want users to use your data more, you have to offer some kind of guidance for the more non-technical users as well. And this is an example, and I think it's an excellent example. Um, it's the website of um, Transport Focus, which is the, um, the organization that um, is, um, well, it's a tram uh, bus from, from the UK. I don't know what the equivalent in Wallonia is. Um, but they are publishing a lot of data about the, the surveys uh, or about quality of public transport. And um, they have on their site these nice videos explaining how people can get access to the data um, and what can be done uh, with the data. So I think this is a, a good example of how you can lower the barrier for non-technical users to get access to your data. Uh, okay, uh, next point. Um, imagine you are um, selling meat um, and in, in this, of course, you're selling data, but in this uh, analogy, uh, you're selling meat. When you're selling meat, I think you also have to talk about um, this little cutie here. Uh, so uh, you need to give a bit more context to what you're selling. You need to um, explain where the data comes from, and you see the tag on the ear of the, of the little cow. Um, so you need to um, give the, uh, the broader picture to your user. You need to explain where the, da data, where the data comes from um, and how it fits into a broader picture. And you can even go one step further. And when you're talking about raising cattle, you also have to mention things like deforestation. And so when you're publishing data, I think it's a good idea to give your user also a bit of context to explain how this data uh, fits into the rest of the data you offer, but also how this data fits into a discussion, the, the public debate or, or the news, for example. And you need to explain why this data is important and, um, and what can be done um, given the, the broader context of society. So my advice would be to give more context, and this can be just a little text describing um, what the broader context is, or uh, you could give um, some experts some room to write about why this data set is important and uh, what could be done with it. Uh, next point, this is um, what I imagine to be a real delicious meal. So, um, okay, I wanted to uh, the Google Translate, but it doesn't come up, so it doesn't matter. I think um, if you don't speak Arab, it's there? Okay. So, when, when the, men, the recipe is like this, I think most of us won't understand, but maybe some people speak or read Arabic, and they will be able to um, prepare the, this delicious meal. Um, it's, I think there's something lost in translation here, potato with rice and sauce, I think uh, the, the original name will be something else. Um, but my point is here, if, if you um, offer the data and your documentation only in one language, then um, a lot of people will simply not have access to the data. And so, um, what you should do is publish in multiple, uh, multiple ling languages. And um, I'm sure in Belgium, uh, most of us do. Uh, one example um, is, for instance, Stadbel. They have here, um, a lot of their content is published in four languages, so that's really great. Also in English. Um, and two weeks ago, I gave a course about data visualization to um, statisticians from national offices um, from across Europe, uh, from official um, uh, offices for statistics. 
And one of them, a, a Swiss guy, he did a survey about uh, on the, the data portals of the um, official bureaus for statistics. And he said to me that almost all of them are publishing um, inf information and data in English as well. So I think this, this is really great um, because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're, you'll exclude a lot um, of your possible users. <coughs> this is um, also an interesting book. Um, it's actually um, a recipe book or a cookbook for blind people, so it's a cookbook in Braille. Um, and um, I, I must admit, I make a lot of data visualizations and I almost never take into account uh, people who have problems with their sight. Um, but uh, at the course I give um, at these stat the statisticians, there was one guy from Slovakia, he had bad eyesight. And um, so that was the first time I really started thinking about this group of people that is also very interested in data. And um, with some simple measures, we can give them uh, some kind of access to the information we are publishing. So um, I would say try to publish um, data or, or uh, descriptions and documentation compatible with screen readers. Once again, the, the Transport Focus website is a nice example. If you go there, you can see they're, um, uh, they're really investing in making their content accessible to uh, people who have bad sight or, uh, or blind people. So uh, I think this is also, once again, a good example. Okay, that, that was the first part about the data itself. Um, but I also want to talk a bit about data portals where the data is published. So if we go back to the Open Knowledge website, or maybe I can just skip to the quote. This is also part of the definition of open data uh, from Open Knowledge. Uh, so the data must also be available in a convenient and modifiable form. And uh, so it, it should be um, uh, convenient to handle the data, but you can also interpret this as um, the, the, the portal or the, the way the data is um, accessible uh, is also very convenient. And I think in a lot of cases, uh, that's not really the case. So we'll keep on using the food analogy. I think a lot of data portals are a bit like this. This is a, a giant supermarket. And as a user, you don't know where to start looking or you, uh, there's no good guidance on um, where you should go. And I think in a lot of cases also, there's just too much information. And um, before you start opening more data, I think you have to think about um, how to open data better. And uh, my apologies to Elaine, the next, uh, uh, the next image is from the open data portal. Um, as you can see, um, at that time, there were 804,000 uh, data sets. There are already more. But for me, as someone looking for some kind of information or a, a specific data set, this is a bit intimidating. Um, when I see this, I think I, I'll never be able to find the data set I'm looking for. Um, so I think this is also something uh, to take into account. Okay, this is... Collect and Go, uh, the Colroyd webshop. Um, what I wanted to show you here is that you could compare this to a data portal. We saw the um, uh, European uh, Open Data Portal where you have here the countries. Now we have here different kinds of food. Um, but what they do really well, of course, is um, showing you this, the, the things you can't miss. And if you go down a little further, um, you also see what's new. And on top, you also have the opportunity to just, um, where is it, um, the menu of the week. And they just give you um, a recipe for each day and you can order the, uh, the ingredients directly from there. Um, so why am I showing you this? I think um, you also have to, think about how you can market your open data. If you're just showing the, all the data that's published on your portal uh, chronologically, then you're missing out on a big opportunity. You could put the uh, most popular data sets uh, on top, for example, 
or the most relevant ones or the data sets which have the highest quality. Um, and you can also track um, which data sets are downloaded the most or on which pages people uh, come the most. And I think it's a good idea to put these things on top of your portal and not bury them um, somewhere, um, somewhere below. Uh, one good example of this is uh, Data USA. Uh, so this is a website collecting open data from different sources uh, in the US and um, making it available in a, a very attractive way. And um, so you can see here the new data sets or highlighted, and I'm sure they also are tracking uh, which of these pages is the most, most popular. Um, so um, they put the, the most popular ones on top because a lot of users are interested in, in these data sets. Okay, next one. Uh, at the university, I had a friend, and uh, when other friends had their birthday, what he did was going to the supermarket and buying some cans of food then stripping off the, the, the labels and, and giving these uh, cans as a gift to, uh, to other people. So you had cans of soup, but also uh, cans of cat food, for example, or dog food. Um, and without the labels, you don't know what's in there. So it's, it's a nice idea, but it's not very usable. What you, of course, need to do is offer some kind of um, a teaser or, or a monster. So people will know um, what's in there and people will know if uh, what they are um, maybe going to buy is really what they are looking for. And if we translate this to um, uh, data publishing, and then it's, this is offering a preview of the data. Um, if you don't uh, offer a preview of what, what's in a, a data set, People will have to download first, then open the file, and then, um, then only see what's in there. If you can give a preview directly um, on the website where people are searching, then they will have a much easier time knowing or um, selecting the data sets uh, they're interested in. Um, maybe, yeah. Data USA is doing this. I'm just going to open an article. And there should be a visualization appear here. Now it's there. And uh, what you can do directly here is view the data and then you will get a preview of what's in there. And as a user, you can then decide, well, okay, this is what I want or not. Um, if you don't have the preview, you have to download first before you can um, even see what's in there. So um, I think uh, giving a data preview can, can help users a lot. Uh, okay, if you want to prepare a meal with different ingredients, um, people would want to go to, um, well, we have here seven ingredients. Um, people are not interested in visiting seven different shops to get all these ingredients. They want everything in one place, uh, like, we, like we saw in the, the Collect and Go by, by Colrad. People don't really care um, about um, where the data is coming from. Uh, for example, um, if I want a list of addresses of schools in Belgium, I need to go to the Flanders um, um, open data or the, the uh, institution responsible for education. I need to go to Wallonia, I need to go to Brussels. Um, as a data journalist, it's um, much easier if, if there's one authority offering all this data um, in one place. So um, users want everything in one place and uh, they don't really care who is responsible for uh, generating the data. They want the data they're interested in just uh, all in one place. So um, I think um, aggregating things um, also has uh, a lot of value for end users. <clears throat> okay, this is a picture from a um, supermarket and it says the choice is yours. Um, but the message obviously um, is not in line with, wh with what is offered there uh, in this shop. And so I think um, we need to talk about usability here. And um, I did a little bit of research and um, maybe I'm wrong and I think some of you know better uh, than I do, but um, my feeling is that there is not a lot of research about how a data portal um, should be more aimed at users, that there is not a lot of uh, user testing involved. Um, one thing I found was this study. 
And I think it's really interesting. So what these people did, these researchers, they just put people in front of the data portal and asked them to look for certain information um, or just basically use the website. And um, then they just, um, they follow people along their journey on this website. And so um, if we can uh, quickly look at what they found. Uh, where is it? So in the end, they have some um, suggestions for making um, um, data portals. So um, better meta description um, descriptions, um, um, really showing that if you select multiple things, that these filters are uh, and filters or or filters, for example, uh, sorting things um, uh, and other elements. So I think. If you're serious about data publishing and if you invest in a, a data portal, then you should also uh, do some user testing because otherwise um, you will miss a lot of uh, users who will simply not find the information uh, they're looking for. Okay, we're, we're almost there. Um, this is someone looking at the menu and um, I think it's pretty obvious that um, you should provide an index or some, um, your data should be indexable or searchable um, by search robots. Uh, in a lot of cases, this is not really the case because um, if you um, only can get to data when uh, you have to select from a, a, a drop down menu, for example, this information that's in the data will not be uh, indexed by um, these um, search robots. So you have to uh, know sure. Um, that you have good descriptions for every data set and um, use the right uh, keywords and that those are not hidden um, behind UI elements like drop downs or, or filters, uh, for example. And here my food analogy stops because I couldn't think about, uh, about a good uh, example of this one. So um, number 12 is um, about embeddable, um, yeah, embeddable data um, and one good example of that is uh, Our World in Data, which is a website publishing um, a lot of data from research mainly uh, about the long, longer term trends um, on different topics uh, in our world. And um, they have this excellent module, I think. Uh, so here you see a visualization, but you can, um, for example, we can look for Belgium here. And the charts then updates, and then if you use um, this one, I think, yeah, you get an embed code. So you can simply embed this chart uh, in your own website, and it, it also respects the filter you set. So you can see here that uh, now the data is filtered on Belgium, and so you can embed this chart in your own website. and. Why is this important, I think, is that a lot of people um, or, or institutions are interested in um, publishing data visualizations, but it's oftentimes very hard to make good visualizations. And if you offer a, something like this, you, you're giving the power to, to the user to just take um, your, your data and publish it without any technical knowledge or without any knowledge about uh, data visualization. And um, they can just go and embed this in an article they are writing, for example. And this also lowers the barrier uh, for using uh, the data you are publishing. So um, that's the, the URL for, this, for these slides. So you can um, access these articles as well. These are two articles I found very, um, very interesting, and I basically took the points from these articles uh, to, to make this presentation. So if you're interested um, um, in um, getting more users to use your data, I think you should read these articles because they, are, um, they make excellent points about usability and, uh, and lowering bar barriers for users. So um, these are uh, really great articles. And so these are my slides, all the links are there. Uh, you can click on the images and they will lead you to um, the things I showed. And with that, I think I can conclude this and I thank you for your attention.